Bob would jump into the trench and run to the door. He and his two men would place 7 LBS of explosive rounds onto the door and blow it open. The first round did nothing and the Germans would probably have heard the noise by now. This made Bob somewhat nervous. The second round would blow the door wide open. They threw in some hand grenades and went in. And to Bob's surprise on the other side were 53 German soldiers ready to surrender. Today I'm back here at Sword Beach again at the town of Easterham where I want to have a more in-depth look at the biggest bunker in the area. In my last video I had a look at the Wiesterham defenses, which was one of the biggest in the area, with more than over 40 bunkers in the general area. Today not much is actually left of the original German defenses. Most of it was torn down for newly developed beachfront property after the war. At WN10 you can now find the Kiefer Commando monument, which was built on one of the bigger bunkers on the site. Today most of the fortifications are buried. Stuk.08 to the north of WN10 is almost completely gone today. One of the biggest structures left is the Hochleitstand or better known today as the Grand Bunker, which I wanted to do a more in-depth look at in this video. But I did an entire video about the entirety of this gigantic fortification, which was literally Rommel's death trap in my last video, and I would recommend you watch it. The Grand Bunker was built in the area of River Bella, which was fortified by the Germans to defend the long stretch of beach, the channel and the 605mm French guns on the beach. All of this would have been defended by several smaller bunkers, minefields, anti-tank ditches, barbed wire and beached obstacles. The fire control post was built from 1942 and would be finished the next year. It would be 17 meters high and would have had 5 levels. This concrete tower provided an exceptional point of view for the German artillery observers, because on the fifth level it would have had a giant telemeter for range finding, which could give fire instructions to the gun batteries in the area, like the Merfield battery. It's not known to me if the tower was actually finished off with a camouflage job, the museum displays the bunker as camouflaged, but I can't really make out if the tower was actually camouflaged from these pictures. Most of these towers would also be elaborately camouflaged as normal houses or apartment buildings, but that wasn't the case for this bunker. The Grand Bunker was of course a observation post and would house telemeters to pinpoint the location of the enemy and relay those coordinates to the Merfolk battery or the other batteries in the area which would then lay down artillery support. The bunker would see home to 50 German soldiers and two officers and had five levels. First level would house, of course, the entrance, which was defended by a narrow corridor, which was defended by three machine guns. It would also have a generator room and a filter room. These filters could air filter fresh air into the bunker in case of a gas attack. The filters could also be hand cranked in case the generator stopped working. The second level would house a hospital, armory and work and living area. The third level would see a second armory and a living area where most of the men slept. The fourth level would see the radio and command room and the fifth of course the telemeter. On top would house the flak gun which could give a deadly crossfire together with the flak tower to the south. The soldiers inside the bunker could communicate from level to level with speaking tubes, several for each floor. These tubes were connected by air pipe through which speech can be transmitted over an extended distance. Before D-Day the bunker was seemingly overlooked, it wasn't mentioned in any reports, it also had not been identified in any aerial photographs or did the French resistance identify it as anything important. The British and French commandos eventually encountering the tower up close would make the tactical decision to leave it be, after they were showered with hand grenades from the top. 
and it did not really form a real threat in their opinion. It is mentioned that one warship did fire upon the tower, which hit it once on the front of the slit, but this did nothing to the tower and there was no return fire. You can actually see the damage in some pictures. But because there was no return fire, they also seemed to just let the tower be. This is where Lieutenant Bob Orell comes into the picture. Bob Orell was a recon officer from the Royal Engineers and he and his men were to land on Sword Beach between Roger and Queen sectors, but in the chaos they would have been dropped off onto another sector. So from the beginning his unit would be scattered around. Bob's mission would have been to recon the area and find out what was going on. He luckily found a small walled up motorbike and started scouting around. In his own words, and I quote, I didn't really find anything out or did I do anything real important on the first day. It wasn't until day 3 he went on his motorbike to look around and he spotted the Grand Bunker, which Bob would eventually write and report about as a point of interest for the engineers and wrote it down as a large powerhouse not yet investigated. After running into some mines on his motorbike, he decided to not test his luck and go back. Later that day, around 10 o'clock that night, he would get the order to investigate the large powerhouse. He ordered a crane driver and a second man to come with him. They took some TNT and went off to investigate, not knowing what to expect. When they approached the tower, it wasn't completely quiet and Bob did not know if anyone had seen him because he did hear some noises coming from what he thought were the tower. But they went up the trench and placed 7 LBS of explosive round to the hinges of the door. Keep in mind that these doors were covered by several MG positions. The first explosion did nothing. Of course the Germans must have heard the explosion. After trying to lift the door off its hinges, they placed the remainder of the explosives on both edges of the door. That time they managed to blow the door completely off, threw in a couple of hand grenades and went in. It said, and I quote, They were surprised to hear a voice say in perfect English, Ha! So not your English. So they said in perfect English, Come upstairs Johnny. It's alright, Bob declined and said, and I quote, Bugger that, you come down. And two officers descended the stairs. They explained that there were 53 of them in total. This made Bob eventually somewhat nervous, because what if the Germans realized they only were three men strong? But it seems that the Germans inside were just tired and intimidated, not mainly because of Bob, but because of the large scale of operation around them, which was a huge intimidating factor. This was also the reason why the Germans stayed this quiet. Another one was of course to inform the German command what was happening around them. So the Germans were moved to a local POW camp and Bob and the commanding German officer investigated the tower. The German officer was ordered to go first in any case there were any booby traps. Be careful, it could be a booby trap. And to Bob's surprise, he found out that the Germans had a party inside the bunker. Because all over the floor were half drunk bottles of wine and liquor. And in Bob's words, he never had seen alcohol before. Heck, he never seen so much alcohol before. And this really makes you think what went through their minds. To just say, we're done. We're going to stop what we're doing and just drink and have a party. After the war, Bob just went on with his life. He went back to the Grand Bunker in 1984 when it was still a ruin. But the story he told that day made it to the owner of the bunker and it said that the story inspired the landowner to open the building up as a museum. Today the museum is one of my favorites in the area. It has a great display inside and outside and focuses mainly on the Atlantic wall. You can visit all floors and even the top one where you can get an amazing view. You will get a great insight into living inside one of these bunkers and what the battle would have looked like back in 1944. Just like the story of Bob Orells and what he did to capture the last German lookout on D-Day. His story is told in text and in a one-to-one -one scale diorama form. All this is a testament to his and his men's bravery. 
I would like to point out that parking in the area isn't free and I would recommend coming in the morning or outside of the high season because the museum will get crowded really fast and the staff seem to not hold up any regulations on how many people they let into the museum. But outside of that this is a great visit. If you want to see a full video on this museum I made a short video that can be viewed by clicking on the icon on the above right corner or in the link in the description below. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel by buying some of my merch or by becoming a channel member. See you in the next one. Now I came into contact with a lot of German POWs later on in life when they were serving on the transit camp, 67th transit camp in Harwich, Essex. And they were family men and men like myself. There was the odd fanatic, but they were just like us, really. You can't judge a book by its cover. There were good and bad amongst all of us.